Somebody that, say, bought a house in 2016 may be like, I just bought a house in 2016. What's the big fucking deal? Like, what's the problem? I can't, you don't know how much things changed in the last three years. The people during COVID that were in, in a position to buy a house when those interest rates were super, super low, they locked in that super low rate and monthly payment back then. Even in just three years, that interest rate has skyrocketed back upwards. I kind of naively was, you know, what am I gonna pay a few extra thousand dollars? If you're taking out a $200,000 loan and your interest rate was 2%, your payment period is 30 years. If your interest rate is only 2%, your monthly payment would be $740. If your interest rate was, let's say the current interest rates of like 7.5%, your monthly payment is now $1,400. It's, it costs you double to take out the same loan just three years later. Everybody that locked in their 2.5% interest rate on their house in 2020, they're, they're feeling really great right now. I think the dating market was somewhat like that. I don't really know a lot of people that have partnered up since COVID. The people I know that were single during COVID are mostly still single, just like the people I know that didn't buy during COVID are mostly still renting. The prices of the homes, which are people, are radically overvalued. People are paying $400,000 for houses that actually cost $200,000. But all these fives that think they're nines, eventually, if the, if the interest rates get bad enough, they'll have to lower their prices. A woman's ability to hoflate herself is dependent on there being chads in the market. If all of the chads or buyers pull out of the market, and say, fuck this, I don't want to meet a girl off Tinder anymore. All these girls are skanks or whatever it is. If they pull out, the, the market would shift. Facebook and the social media was dating markets without really calling it that. And the people that are still actively hanging around on Facebook and posting, it's like, oh, this is a fool's den. And all of these sites or platforms go through that boom bust cycle where it's exciting at first, the cool people start pulling away or either moving to whatever's next, and then you're left with a bunch of uh, fools, I'll call them. So I was on OkCupid back in like 2012 or 2013, and I think the first time I did tell people back home, you know, they were all like, oh my gosh, that'll never happen here. Within three years, it became the total norm for even like college students. Have you seen any of these uh, flavor of articles recently kind of about the great male dropout that men across the job market and like general participation in society, which would be also the dating market, are almost completely withdrawing from it? Sort of like some of the stuff that's happened in like Korea or Japan or... Yeah, no, I haven't seen that, but... I mean, this is related to the incel stuff and all that. Where, um, I have... Uh, I have sort of a soft spot for the the incels or the incel thing because it's, I mean, a lot of it's just like autistic people that are basically leveled out of the dating market. When polled, I think about 60% of women said they were in a relationship. But then the percentage of single men is drastically higher. It's like uh, only 30% or something of men. How does that work? Those women that are saying they're in a relationship, they might think they're in a relationship with some guy they're banging on Tinder. But if you asked that guy, are you in a relationship? He would say no, because he's banging three other ladies. Uh, you know what a harem is? A thousand women to one man. You got some Chad with a sword and he's got literally, he's just killing incels left and right. He's cutting them down. And every incel he cuts down, he gets another lady. They're like, oh my God killed that guy that's very hot there's a lot of uh dysfunction you know that wouldn't work very well over time men and women sort of pairing up at a one-to-one -one ratio came to be the most productive way to build a society betty i understand that teddy is not your number one choice but teddy actually has a lot of brains trying to balance out um the strength to brains 
preference. There's a reason that there's 100,000 screaming people for in Bryant Denny Stadium and not 100,000 screaming people at a Chester. Shows of dominance, power, aggression, and seeing which one wins, and they want to be on the winning team. I know that individual people have their preferences, but on the general. If you're an academic and you suck at being an academic and you get beat every time you play, you don't get any bitches. They'll bang anybody. It's not just your money or like your status in society, it's like an inner attitude. No matter how much money he stacks or how he gets his hair transplanted or whatever it is, women can smell fakeness. Actually, these days, they're hormonally messing up their stuff. I'm, I'm not kidding. Okay. That's kind of going mainstream now. You have the rise of these like grifter characters like Andrew Tate and people that are basically like weaponizing that. Could Andrew Tate kick the shit out of me? Yeah, he could. Hello, mate. What they're trying to do by saying this, they're trying to start followings, pseudo cults, grifting money. Hello, mate. Let me tell you today about birth control. Your scent is important. I don't mean just like, do I smell like I'm wearing deodorant? No, I don't smell like I'm wearing deodorant. For the environment, does he smell right? Because if somebody's in a club in Miami, she's looking for an Andrew Tate type character. And an Andrew Tate type character is gonna signal his wealth and his status by <laughs> like people are always smelling and taking in other people even if they don't know it. Clean hormones in and out. The smell she might be attracted to is not necessarily gonna be the guy that's <laughs> I would rather be able to, a woman to smell my natural state. Me at my house, I wanna smell like me at my house. You don't want to smell like mildew, you don't want to smell like bacteria, you don't want to smell like poop. You don't want to smell like you don't know how to wipe your ass. But I, I think that what bothers me about the bidets is how pleasurable men seem to find them. They're like, oh my god, it feels so good. That is my point though, is that people seem interested in pleasuring them. So I don't mean like to orgasm or anything, yeah. but they're, they're like, oh. <laughs> the countries that are most bidet heavy, they're going to be like Sweden, Denmark, and Japan. A lot of those countries, okay? Uh, would you consider those more masculine countries or would you consider them more sort of gender neutral countries? I have no idea. You get a nice bidet. You get bidet culture. The most masculine country. Some, some Afghanistan. You know, somewhere where they're still using curved swords and they're chopping heads off. They wipe their hand with their ass. Before, before implementing a new tool to wash your ass better, Ask yourself, why is my digestion so bad that I need a fire hose in my asshole after my morning coffee? You know, why do I need to be hosed down? In my, in my healthiest times of life, there's one eight inch log every morning and I barely have to do it. It's highly efficient. Um, and that's if I'm eating right, if I'm, I'm mentally balanced, if I'm spiritually balanced, things won't be so out of whack if you need like a gizmo. You need electronics down there. A lot of this is based on people not knowing how to wipe their ass. Maybe a majority of Americans can't functionally read and don't know how to wipe their ass. <laughs> Wad it up and then just sort of do something down there. And you know, at the end of the day, let the waters wad it up, let the bidayers bidet, and uh, everybody do their, do their thing but you could figure out sort of a man's uh, gender values or loose politics based on his ass wipe. How you do anything is how you do everything. Have you ever heard that before?